Thanks, Sand. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to you all. Welcome to worship. Can you all hear me? Am I on? Hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just keeping you all awake. Anyway, um, a very warm, extremely warm welcome to you all this morning. Wonderful that you're all here to worship together with us. Welcome to all those joining us on Zoom. Good to have you here as well. And of course, any listening later on a recording or a video, wherever that may end up. Um, and it's good to have everybody here worshipping this morning. Um, it's great that we've got our own local preacher in training, Peter Gray, leading our worship this morning. I'm sure we're going to have a great time. But before I hand over to Peter, let me just remind you all that the service is being recorded. So if you're at the front, you'll be on camera. Um, the other thing to say is, of course, that COVID is still with us. So please respect all those who choose voluntarily to still wear a mask that's absolutely fine and just be conscious of that need to be careful socially distancing is quite a good idea still given that covid is on the rise as we know please join us for refreshments after the service um, through the door there tea coffee cold drinks probably very welcome today but come and share in some of that and just one thing to remind you I suspect it's on the notice sheet this morning but this afternoon at five o'clock at Toton Methodist Church there's a farewell service for the Reverend Matt Fugel who of course used to be one of our ministers here a few years ago he and his wife Rebecca who's now completed her own training as a Methodist minister are being stationed to Cornwall from September so they are shortly to be moving so please join us for that service to help give them a good send-off before Peter carries on with our worship with us this morning let's just have a few moments of quiet as we prepare ourselves and bring ourselves before God Good morning and welcome to this morning's service. I, oh, excuse me a minute. So, cancel that one, sorry. <laughs> um, so this morning, I've got to apologize in advance. Apparently, um, the projector over this side isn't, sorry, yes, Paul? Yeah, that's the right sheet, that's right. This morning's service is about distractions and you've just witnessed two of them. That was all planned. <laughs> um, I will now turn my own phone off so that there isn't any more in the way of uh, interruptions. But um, today's service, as I say, yes, it's about distractions. Welcome to everybody on Zoom. I'm hoping later on in the service when I use my visual aid, I've got a camera set up there that they will be able to take part with us as well so that they can see what's happening. We're going to start with a couple of hymns we're going to sing number 59 shine jesus shine and follow that up immediately with number 77 forever god is faithful
77, forever God is faithful. We're going to have a period of prayer now. We're going to say our prayers of praise and thanksgiving. We're going to bring our sins before God and ask for forgiveness. We will say the Lord's Prayer and we will bless the offertory. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you with praise and thanks in our hearts for the endless care and generosity you show us. By your hand we exist, and we live in a world of beauty and wonder. Skies of sapphire blue and velvet black, the calm of a summer's day, and the majesty and power of the tempest. All are wrought by your hand and moved to your bidding. All life belongs to you, and we bow before you in humble wonder and praise, thankful for the gift of redemption bought and paid for by the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, we come before you as sinful people, acknowledging the wrong we have done in the past days, sins of deed and of omission, careless of the gifts that you have given to us and unheeding of the hurt we have caused you and others by our own selfishness. We repent of these sins and seek once again to make things right with you, O God. Here then is the great gift of God. Through the sacrifice of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our sins can be forgiven if we turn to him and believe. Amen. Thanks be to God. 
we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We say a prayer to bless the gifts of the offertory and everything that has been brought by us this week. Lord, bless the gifts we bring to you both here and through other means. Gifts financial and gifts of action. May all of them be turned to your work and purpose for all people here on earth. Amen. Who's had a busy week? Put my hand up. If plans had gone right, I think I'd have been out practically every night this week and work's not been any easier. Um, I think I've seen Elaine for about three hours at some point on some days. It's been induction week at school, so all the year sixes have come up to see their new school and meet their new tutors. And for us as tutors, and I'm getting a year six form this year, uh, it's great, but it's extra work because you're not with your normal classes. So you have to find out what you're doing with the year six classes and set the work for the classes you would have been teaching otherwise. And then, Monday night we were supposed to have a meal for a colleague who was leaving. Tuesday night would have been my local preacher's tutorial. Wednesday night I had a parents evening and there was a local preacher's meeting. I'm not quite sure which one I was supposed to go to, but I went to the parents evening because I'm contractually obliged there. Thursday was taking Jasmine to Girls Brigade and Naomi was at camp at that point and then I had to pick her back up again. Tell you what, if I hadn't written it all down, I wouldn't have known what I was doing or where I was supposed to be. And sometimes life's like that. It's absolutely rammed full of things. And you sometimes think, if there's one more thing, my head's going to explode. I'm not going to know what I'm doing. Sometimes life is full like that for longer periods of time and you look ahead in your diary and you think, if I come out the other side of this, I'm going to be doing really, really well. There's a saying, that that doesn't take us away makes us stronger. And certainly if you come out the other side of some busy weeks, you're definitely stronger. You might be absolutely shattered, but you're probably stronger at the end of it. The thing is, when you're busy, it's really easy to forget God. God doesn't forget us. He's still there, but it's easy for us to forget God and to think about him. I've got a little visual aid that I'm going to use here, and this is where hopefully this technology here for the Zoomers will work. Can everybody see the table? Because I don't really want to move stuff too far away, otherwise their camera doesn't work. I've got a jar, and on the jar is written life. Turn that so they can see. And apologies, sorry, I should say apologies to Reg and Shirley, because they saw this, this demonstration or a variation of it a couple of weeks ago at Bramcup. So I'm afraid it's a repeat. BBC isn't what it used to be. <laughs> so this jar represents our lives. Or, it's a little bit thing you know, sort of odd, but we can fill it with things. The pasta, and I had to go to Tesco, I don't like Tesco, but I had to go to Tesco because it's the only place we'd find that sold multicolored pasta. Because there's different things in our lives. I could have just dumped a load of normal yellow pasta in there and gone, that's everything that happens in your life. But by having multicolored pasta, not only does it look really good, but also it can represent different things happening in life. Work, family, paying bills, supporting other people, going to church, all those sorts of things. I've only got three colors in here. I'll let you decide which ones you ascribe to the various aspects of your life. 
Oops, that's good, isn't it? So I can fill the jar with pasta. I'm actually going to take a little bit out because I need a little bit of space for the next bit. Hoping, yes, it all looks pretty good on, on the screen down there. So there's our lives full. No space for God. No space for his word. Is that right? Well, I hope not. And I hope this makes it clear. I've now got, I've raided the cupboard at home, I've now got my rice. If you're on a carb-free diet, it's not a good analogy. <laughs> but the rice represents God in our lives. God's word, the Holy Spirit, and everything else. Hopefully, I've got to take this a little bit more slowly, but hopefully I can get that in. Oh dear, I to apologise to Miss Higgins, the cleaner, later on. But I give it a shake. Oh look, it's all started to settle down. And I can fit, I'm going to turn that so the Zoom people can see. I can fit some more in there. A little bit more of a shake. I tell you what, from the top, it looks like you hear the word of God and it disappears completely and then you hear it again. Whether there's another sermon in that, I'm not sure, but I'm not worrying about that one today. And I keep adding, it's almost like Christmas lectures. There we go, it doesn't want to disappear in the same way. So now, all the little gaps that you didn't realize were there, that you didn't think about, have become filled with the presence of God. God is with you in your lives. And even if it's two minutes on the bus, you can spend that time with him, thinking, talking, and listening. But that's my analogy for busy lives. We're gonna come back to busy lives in a minute, but we're going to have our reading, uh, no, we're going to have a hymn now, I apologize. We're going to sing number 477, Teach Me to Dance.
Now we're going to have our reading. So, you're just going to have to bear with us. Sue's going to read for us, so there's a radio mic going over to her, and then Jasmine's going to read our gospel message. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Marmar while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed to the ground. He said, If I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may wash your feet and rest under the trees. Let me get you something to eat, for you will be refreshed, and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, do as they say, they said. So Abraham hurried into the tent. Sarah, quick, he said, get three sheaves of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to the servant, who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk from the calf that had been prepared, and set these before them. While they ate, he stood there under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? they asked. There, in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you before this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. This reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. He had, she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about too many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. Thank you both. Two fairly familiar readings. Visitors meeting Abraham in the heat of the day and him making a fuss over them and Jesus visiting with Mary and Martha. And so often happens with sisters, there's a bit of an argument and a bit of friction because one of them's doing all the work and one of them's sitting doing nothing, apparently. This second bit of the sermon I've called Carpe momentum. Seize the moment. So I'm not going to do any Robin Williams impressions or mess about on stage like that. But seize the moment. When life is busy, and we're just coming back to the jar of pasta and rice a minute, a routine, a plan can really really help. I live my life by a timetable, what class I'm teaching, where I'm supposed to be teaching it, and so on. We all like routines. They keep us comfortable. We know what's going to happen next. We know when it's supposed to happen. If it's routine, it's probably happened before, so we know what it should look like. We know when it's going wrong. Stepping outside of that routine can seem threatening. We expose ourselves to the potential of chaos and uncertainty and 
This happens occasionally in my lessons, having to wing it a bit because things go wrong. The problem is, routine is not always the best thing. Routine can stifle creativity. It can limit your viewpoint because you're never doing anything different. You're never trying anything. In some cases, we can become preoccupied with the routine itself. And we get distracted from the bigger picture. I will mutter about classes that arrive at my classroom five minutes late without really thinking about the fact that possibly they've just been for their COVID vaccinations or their tetanus vaccinations or there's been an incident on the field. I've lost that big picture. All I can think of is my lesson's starting late. I'm not going to get through what I needed to get through before the end of it. It's not good enough. This should be there on time. And I lose track of what it's all about. Sometimes people use routines, timetables, jobs, things like that, to avoid having to confront uncomfortable things within their lives. Just keep going on with the humdrum and don't have to think about that bill that's got to be paid or this that's got to happen or that appointment or what those results are going to be or whatever. In our second reading, Martha expects Jesus to tell Mary off for not helping with the jobs. Martha seems quite worried by the chaos that might ensue if Mary doesn't pick up a tea towel and wipe some pots or chop some vegetables or, or whatever it is that isn't being done. The thing is, Jesus doesn't do what Martha expects. He turns it on its head instead and says that Martha is allowing herself to be distracted by her routine and all these jobs and keeping busy and everything else, instead of taking the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with him and listen to what he's got to say. An opportunity that won't happen again. I do wonder what it was Martha was trying to avoid in what Jesus was saying. What was it perhaps she didn't want to confront in her own life that she was worried he might talk about. Routine and day-to-day -day stuff is very important. It's a scaffold, it's a framework, it's a point of reference against which our lives can be set. Stepping away from it though, Seizing onto something fleeting, grabbing that opportunity is just as important. Mary was taking time away from the domestic tasks to spend the time listening to Christ. She was actually making herself less busy so she could focus on what he got to say. Conversely, Abraham is sat doing very little in the heat of the day. Probably going to reflect what a lot of us will be doing on Monday and Tuesday this week, I hope. Doing as little as possible so that we stay as safe as possible. But suddenly he's aware of these three men. It says they're men, they could have been women. Three people. Hovering just in the corner of his eye. And he takes an opportunity. He could have tried to ignore them. He could have adjusted his seat a little bit so they went out of the vision, pretended they weren't there. He could have just waved at them. You're all right, gents. Nice to see you. And carried on with his 40 winks in the afternoon. 
He could have directed them towards one of his servants. Go and see this person. They'll sort you out with some food, a bit of shade, have a rest with us, that's fine. And not really concerned himself more than that. But he didn't. Instead, he ran about himself organizing people. I want you to kill this animal. I want you to make some bread. And he invited these people in and he made a fuss of them. He took an opportunity that wasn't planned to do something special for a stranger or three strangers. He made them the focus. And he allowed himself to be a little bit distracted, maybe, from doing nothing into doing something. Every day, we're going to need to decide what is important and how we're going to respond to it. We can't just rely on the same things again and again and again. It's a Monday. I'm going to start out with year nine. I'm then going to have year sevens, and then I'm going to finish off with my year 11s. We need to keep God in mind. We need to keep what he wants us to be doing in mind. We need to focus on the things he's got planned for us. Not necessarily the routine, not necessarily the timetable and the things we thought we'd probably be doing because it's that particular time of the day or that particular time of the week. Sometimes, yes, he will want us to follow the path of routine, the things that we always do. But often he'll present us with an opportunity, an opportunity to do something, to see something, to hear something that wouldn't otherwise be there. Knowing what is being presented to us can be a little bit difficult. I want to give you another analogy. And it's that of a stormy sea, which is often what bits of our life are like. And a lighthouse. Now the lighthouse, I found out yesterday, isn't there to guide you to safety, it's to actually warn you away. I did know that, but I'd not made the connection. Fishermen, painted their cottages bright colours so that they could be seen in poor light. And it was the bright cottages of home that drew them on. The lighthouse warned them to stay away from the rocks and things like that. But the lighthouse, when you're far out at sea, when you've got no other point of reference, will serve as your guide to get you close to home. And then you've got to find that last little bit yourself. Stepping off the well-trodden path in order to get close to what God wants us to do can sometimes be a bit daunting. If you're not careful, you can miss the opportunity. Sometimes we need to be focused in action Sometimes we just need to be focused on God. The distractions, is it the right worksheet? Have I arranged for my wife to ring me immediately after the steward's welcome to make a point? The distractions vary, but we need to keep focused on those important things. I'm going to play a song. The words are going to be on the screen. I had sort of planned another hymn karaoke and teach you another song out of Songs of Fellowship. But with only having one screen working, I'm going to leave it down to you. You don't have to sing. You don't have to get up. But I'm going to play a song by a band called The Wren Collective. And it's called My Lighthouse. And the words of the song, which should appear on the screen, 
a little bit dim, but hopefully you can read them, seem quite relevant to the struggles we might have in life and the distractions and being focused. If you want to join in and sing, please feel free to. But if you don't feel able to, please don't worry. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. to show Quite sure why it all got out of sync, so probably a good job we weren't trying to sing along at the time. I could hear one or two people sort of whispering though, so one or two people knew it. That was nice to know. Nice to know. Right, we're going to come to our prayers of intercession now. I've been asked to include in the prayers, or to say to you to include in your prayers, Bill Hall and his family. Unfortunately, Bill's daughter passed away this week. We prayed last week for her and knew she was ill. She's passed away during the week. So we remember in our prayers, Bill and all the family. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for our world, your world, the one that we've neglected and mistreated. 
We ask that you show us how to restore it to match your vision. Guide those who seek to lead in this and help us all to hear what needs to be done. Give to us the will to carry those things through. As we face a period of difficult weather conditions in the coming few days, we ask that you watch over all for whom this will be a period of worry and stress or difficulty, danger and risk. We pray for your church, for its leaders and its members across the face of the planet, different races and cultures, but one body, believing in you and acting in your name. Give us the power and the words to draw all people to your love and salvation. We pray for your church here in Beeston, as we progress in our journey to modernize our premises, to try and to meet the spiritual needs of the people in our community and to strive to build and develop a worshipping community that will continue to do your work far into the future. We pray for our leaders and in this time of political turmoil we ask that you speak into their hearts and help them to find the right path forward, even if it isn't the most convenient or the easiest. We pray for our society. Help us to remember also that besides the headlines of the day, there continue to be many in our towns and cities who are struggling, who do not have enough to eat, and for who the approaching holiday period is not a time of joy, but a time of worry, stress, and hardship. We pray for the sick and struggling people of the world, those with chronic illness, those who suffer but will recover through the efforts of medical staff. We pray for those awaiting diagnoses, facing an uncertain future, or those whose future is known but is not what they would seek. Be with them, comfort them and their families, strengthen them and help them through the hard times, we pray. We pray for those who know grief and loss, particularly this time we remember Bill and his family. We pray for others that we may know who suffer with grief and loss either in recent days or in the past. We ask that you bear them all up and walk with them as they, they remember those that they have lost and try to get through each day of their own lives. Let them feel your presence and know they are not alone. Finally, we pray for ourselves. We ask that you fill our lives with your spirit and support each of us in the ways only we and you can know. Give us the means and the guidance to fulfill your purpose here on earth, helping us to focus on the things that are important, whether planned in advance or an unexpected opportunity. We ask all these things in and through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing our closing hymn now. Hear the call of the kingdom, number 407.
Send us out into the world, alert to whatever nudges us to hear you calling, or whatever points us in your way. Make us bold to resist those who would keep us in the comfortable, well-trodden paths, so, like Mary, we can break free from time to time to sit at your feet. Amen. Whether we're at the front or not, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, Andy.